Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, and on behalf of Jewish Funders Network, I'm happy to welcome you to today's program on Applied Research, a powerful tool for making change. Strategic philanthropy depends upon good data and research. However, it's not only about the data you have, but what you do with it. In order to make good decisions and work effectively with nonprofit partners to drive change, funders must have a solid understanding of what research and data is available and how to translate that, into, that information into action. This session will explore how funders, nonprofits, and researchers can work more effectively together to guide big bets or make targeted interventions. The panel of researchers, funders, and program leaders on the call will help you incorporate applied research into your philanthropic toolbox. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's panel, Rella Kaplowitz, Senior Program Officer, Evaluations and Learning at the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Foundation. Thank you so much, Rella. Thank you and welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you're joining us today. <clears throat> I have the privilege of leading a conversation today with three individuals who care very deeply about turning information into knowledge and knowledge into practice. Thank you to our panelists who are joining us today. Stacy Turner, who's the Director of Evaluation and Learning at the Jim Joseph Foundation. Dr. Ariel Levitas, the Managing Director of the Consortium for Applied Studies in Jewish Education, KASG, and Rabbi Yehuda Sarna, Executive Director of the Bronfman Center at NYU at New York University. Welcome, welcome. Um, I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves and to help frame this conversation about applied research, which is a discussion topic today. To share a quick story about how lives, I'm going to kick it to Stacy and then Arielle and Yehuda. Hi. Um, I, I think when you asked this prompt, Rella, the thing that came to mind was um, when I was working at Teach for America and there was some research coming out about how um, students tended to do better, have better outcomes, which meant better grades and test scores, but also fewer suspensions and few, lower dropout rates. Um, when they had teachers who either looked like them or had come from similar backgrounds. Um, and so Teach for America pivoted pretty quickly in their recruitment to very actively recruit um, core members of color, core members from low income communities, core members from the foster care system. Um, and, and once they had done that, they continued to collect data and actually show that that was true even for their for their programming. Um, so to me, that was just such a great, clear example of using applied research um, to improve your program. Ariel? Hi, everyone. I'm Ariel Levitas from CASG. Um, so um, I think an example that is um, forefront, foregrounded in my mind is a recent uh, CASG study that we released this summer, a study of early childhood education. Um, that was funded by Crown Family Philanthropies. Um, they have a tremendous commitment to Jewish early childhood education, and they wanted to understand and ensure that the field was maximizing the potential for these programs to engage uh, young families Jewishly. Um, the study began, like all CASG studies do, uh, by bringing stakeholders together to understand what shared problems and questions there were facing Jewish ECE across the field. And those questions shaped the design of a research study. Um, the study showed that Jewish ECE can be a powerful force for increased engagement and also where the potential wasn't always being realized. And also what we found is that the field of Jewish ECE was so hungry for a study of this kind um, which I think speaks to the dedication and professionalism of Jewish early childhood educators. They were hungry for good data that told them what they were doing well and where they could meet their own goals better. And they've been using this CASG study as a blueprint for rebuilding in the face of COVID, for planning for what comes next. And just, you know, in my position at CASG, I've really been inundated with requests at the metropolitan level, BJEs, federations, to talk about what the study means for their work. Uh, the URJ JCCA task force and early childhood education and its leadership council is using this study to frame their work. And just in that pathway alone, um, the research is poised to impact practice and policy for 
uh, some like 465 early childhood programs reaching tens of thousands, over 65,000 children in those programs. Um, we're going to talk about it at FedLab because people who do this work want to be data informed. Um, and at CASG, we want to use applied research to give people the tools they need to do their best. Um, hi, my name is Yehuda Sarna. And um, aside from being the director of the Bronfen Center for the past two years, I've been leading an initiative called the Applied Research Collective, uh, which seeks to pull together scholars from different fields and uh, produce thought papers which can help guide and advise uh, philanthropies, foundations, and federations. So uh, fr from my standpoint, my interest was less in providing data. So I guess in that way, somewhat uh, uh, different than what Ariel just mentioned, but more so in providing paradigms, ways of thinking about, um, about the changes that we would want to see, what ultimately generates meaning. Um, are there any paradigms that, um, that we've been stuck in as uh, in the field of philanthropy? That if we were if we were able to release ourselves even somewhat, um, you know, we would find um, different outcomes, productive outcomes. So the the way that we achieved it over the past few years is uh, through pulling together a diverse group of scholars, an interdisciplinary group, actually uh, mostly in the humanities, diverse group in terms of their Jewish identification. So some you know really inside, some outsiders, some in married, out, out married, straight, gay. Uh, um, you know, in the academy, in the field, and to really through a process of exploration, um, enabling questions to come up and then seeing what kind of responses, um, I guess paradigms for assessment um, could come up. And I'll just give you one example of something which had particular meaning for, for anybody who was kind of watching what was happening um, to Jewish identity, Jewish education, during the, the peak of the pandemic, at least from, for, for where I am in the Northeast around April. Um, one of our scholars, John um, uh, Levinson, what decided to study, um, he was curious about curriculum, but he was also curious about the, what the goals of Jewish education were. And he named something which he calls a uh, possession, a uh, possessor paradigm, where the purpose of education is to see what will a child, student, or adult, what will they, what will they be able to hold? What can be put into their container over the course of a, of a period of study? And um, he began reflecting on this, both in light of, kind of traditional Jewish texts, as well as the moment, you know, the information age, project-based learning, and he said, well, maybe there can be an alternative view of Jewish education, which is based not on possession, but on uh, uh, production, what someone can make. And uh, this really came into focus around uh, April during the, the in preparation, those last day or two days before the Passover Seder, where many, 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 many people were put in the circumstance where for the first time they uh, were called on not just to attend a Seder, but to lead their own Seder. And for some people, it was almost like a, a, uh, a mirror that was held up to them. I, I've been able to follow along for so long, but was I really equipped? Did I really have the same kind of ownership um, skills to make a Seder on my own? So I, I share this with you just as an example, um, but also where I'm coming from is is less in the uh, kind of data driven, from a data driven standpoint, but more so through uh, using interdisciplinary uh, exploration to help us understand the paradigms that have governed us and in what ways they could be loosened or redefined in order to open up other opportunities for change. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a conversation. We will talk for about the next half an hour, 35 minutes, and we'll leave time at the end for Q and A. Um, if you have a question that um, you know you, uh, you want to ask one of the panelists or that you think is relevant to the, the discussion that we're having, you can also feel free to use the Q&A function. It's the button that's right next to the chat button in your Zoom window. Um, Arielle, I'm going to start with you. Can you just give us a little bit of an overview? What is applied research and how is applied research different from evaluation or general research? 
So I would say that, first of all, CASG's approach, which is, you know, we do applied studies, that's in our name. It's always been governed by the idea that we're seeking to produce research that's reliable, meaningful, and useful. And that is actually best achieved when we work in collaboration and partnership, researchers and practitioner, practitioners and researchers and policymakers. Um, and from CASG's perspective, what makes research applied research is the question of how it is to be used. Um, CASG supports research that is intended for use. It, it specifically, it is intended to guide improvements in Jewish education practice and policy, right? Every CASG project starts with a fundamental question. How will this research help stakeholders make better decisions that will lead to better outcomes in Jewish educational settings. Um, and fundamentally applied research from our point of view is research that is designed from the outset, from the beginning to solve a real world problem held by real live groups of people doing the work. Um, so it's not just about a commitment to methodology or the technical aspects, although I would love to tell you, for example, about our technical advisory committee and the nitty gritty of the, the kinds of things that we bring um, to research to try and increase the capacity in the field to do work that's most reliable. Um, but I think critically what makes something applied, right, is the commitment that the best research is produced when it responds to real enduring problems of practice that stakeholders in Jewish education face. Um, so I have a little slide, if you'll permit me, I promise it's just, it's just the one um, that I think just gives a little perspective on how we think about it. And hopefully you can just see that. Um, so this is actually, I did not invent this. This is uh, borrowed, adapted from Daniel Stokes's book that maybe some of you are familiar with, Pester's Quadrant, which was a very influential book in thinking about the development of research in the U.S. And essentially, we're looking for research at CASG in that beautiful orange sweet spot, right, that both helps advance larger shared questions that build knowledge for a field and also takes into account how research will be used and by whom. Um, so I've, I've worked on all kinds of projects. Some of the work I do is in that pure basic theoretical research, um, just as an academic, like I'm writing a book about American Jewish spirituality. Um, that's really responding to questions in the academic world about American religion and religious emotion. And it's a lot of fun and I think it's going to be a great book, but it's not applied. It's not actually geared towards helping Jewish spiritual educators think about the outcomes of their work and how to make sure that they're meeting their own goals. Through my work at CASG, however, I'm working with the Institute for Jewish Spirituality. Um, we're uh, putting together a convening that's going to bring stakeholders together to think about the work of Jewish spiritual education and particularly how it um, can best serve um, a younger generation of American Jewish adults. Um, and I think what also takes it out of that like pure applied uh, work in that it's not just towards a good program evaluation for the Institute for Jewish Spirituality is that one of the first things that I said is actually we're going to invite all of your competition, right? Because this is actually about trying to find research questions that are shared across a, a whole field of people, sort of all, you know, uh, uh, working to, to make sure that Jewish uh, education and learners have the most opportunities and the best opportunities to reach their highest aspirations for what their programs can look like. So that's, that's kind of my own thinking and working definition of uh, applied research. I think like um, I, could, I could say a little more like in thinking about when is something maybe that like that more fundamental or basic research or general research versus um, evaluation. Um, I think that there are like clues you can look to in a, in a study design or report that give you insight into it. Um, I think um, in distinguishing between research and evaluation, for example, some things I might think about are um, in the case of, you know, is there a literature review, right? Is this a project that was designed to grow knowledge and understand how this piece of inquiry fits into a larger shared effort? Yes, then it's puts it more sort of to, towards research than from than evaluation. You know, how is it disseminated? Is this for any reader that's curious about work? 
or is it proprietary? Is it only for an intimate circle of program funders and program professional staff? Right, that's the difference sometimes between research and evaluation. Um, was it peer reviewed? That's a principle of research integrity. Was it conducted in alliance with those principles of research ethics and integrity, right? Does it make its findings public, both the good and the bad? Um, was the research team independent? Were they allowed to share the full picture of what they learned? Um, that I think are ways we can think about the difference between research and evaluation. And then I think in distinguishing between sort of like, you know, pure basic research and applied research, uh, again, I think about uh, who was involved in the project. Were the end users partners in the work? Was the study designed to take into account their problems and their questions? Um, that to me um, is, is a good signal that it's applied uh, research. Um, and so looking for clues to that in terms of who, who helped design the project um, and who um, is advising as it develops is, is another thing to look, look at. Um, I'll say if anybody heard the podcast um, with Dr. Lila Corwin Berman and Andres Quinn, did anybody hear that one about um, that was in some ways I thought uh, the tensions between um, two ways of thinking about research, right? You had a historian and the, the kinds of questions that she wanted to answer, um, you know, holding up a mirror to the historical processes that have brought us to the sort of the state of where Jewish communal philanthropy is today. And then we had, you know, the questions of practice from the professional community. And a little bit, they were kind of talking across each other because they were looking for research to raise different kinds of questions, both of which are valuable and needed, but um, they, they weren't kind of bridging the gap. Uh, so I thought that was like an interesting uh, illustration sometimes of that problem. Uh, so I'll let someone else speak now, thanks. Thanks, Ariel. Yehuda, I'll kick it over to you. Can you talk a, a little bit about what applied research means from your perspective? Sure. So uh, my, my approach is that um, applied research is actually a social process. And uh, let me lay out for you what I mean. Sometimes being able to bridge the gap between the people who spend all day thinking and the people who spend all day doing is an extremely difficult part. It's almost like there's different, uh, I found at least, in trying to bridge between academics and practitioners, people are speaking different languages. Uh, and and uh, let me just get a little bit more specific. For most people, members of the academy, you make your name in your profession by breaking something down, by busting something. Uh, when you're working in the field, you make your name by building something. And so the whole orientation around how knowledge can be used to destroy, you know, myth bust or to build, which often involves creating myth, creating story. These are like very, very, very different orientations. So a lot of what we had to do uh, in our group of fellows was uh, in bringing together practitioners, doers, and, and academics and thinkers was try to create a, uh, a common language you know, or, or if not a common language, try to create a, a bridge which allowed for the steady traffic back and forth, the, the zooming in and zooming out between the world of ideas and the world of action. And the, my, the premise, I mean, it's an experimental premise, is that if we have those people together in a room working on, uh, working from the place of common curiosity, then almost out of necessity, unless someone's a bully, as people are bullying the conversation one direction or another, uh, we will end with something which is not a 30,000 foot view or a ground view, but something right there in between that is on the one hand informed by, by ideas, but on the other hand is close enough to planet Earth that can actually mean anything. And I don't wanna, I don't wanna, um, I can't understate, overstate, can't overstate the importance of, uh, of, of, of appreciating and designing this social process. So often what happens, to a point of frustration on both ends, both the people who produce research as, the, as well as the people who ostensibly uh, consume it or are meant to use it, is that researchers will get frustrated when they feel like no one really cares ultimately about the things that they've produced. And on the consumer end, the practitioners will say, 
hey, why are they spending so much time making something which just feels like it's a different language and doesn't have anything to do with me? So actually building in to every research process the vo those different, those multiple voices where it's not as simple as, uh, okay, here I did this in this program, I got X and X results, you know, uh, which is very much, it's on the ground to the ground. And as opposed to other people who are writing from the sky to the sky, building into, into designing into applied, building into the design of applied research, the, 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 the overcoming the social gap between, uh, between the ecosystems of knowledge and ecosystems of action, I think it's something that's been proven very important to me. Stacey, did you have anything you wanted to say specifically to this question? If not, I have another question. Yeah, I mean, I think what you said about myth busting is so interesting because I think a lot about um, what, are, what are the assumptions that we're making that we don't necessarily know that we're making? And where and when do we need to really test those assumptions in order to make sure um, that we're investing in the right ways or we're implementing programs in the right ways. So that was, that was an interesting way that you, you framed that same kind of process that goes on in my head. Stacey, I'm also wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how philanthropy and foundations can, can think about the why of investing in applied research. Um, you know, the majority of the people I think who are participating in the webinar today are involved in philanthropy in some way, shape, or form. So, I, I mean, I think um, you know, the Jim Joseph Foundation has been uh, very supportive of advocating for data-driven decision-making. We've, um, we've added money to program grants since the beginning of, of our in fund, um, since the beginning of our, since the beginning of the foundation, um, we've added money to most of our grants for a program evaluation um, in the hopes that by hiring an outside evaluator and going through the process of, of developing a, a logic model or a theory of change and collecting data and making meaning of that data and figuring out how you can change what you're doing based upon that meaning making in order to be more successful you know that was that's program evaluation to us and that's always uh, and will continue to be um, important to us because it builds the capacity of our grantees to to make better decisions um, and and then we we are also um, supportive of applied research in that we see we see applied research as a way to answer questions that either the field has or that we have um, about what's happening, what's not happening, um, and how, how we can make our own future decisions um, be more effective. Um, you know, I think that um, some of the research that we funded around the Gen Now research, you know, helped us understand teens and the young adult research helped us understand how young adults were or were not engaging. Um, I, you know, we, we've always kind of um, tried to think about projects that other funders are interested in so that if we were doing a research project and we can co-fund with somebody to answer some of their questions, like all the better. Um, uh, I know that um, the CASG, the two, the CASG projects are always co-funded. Um, and uh, I think that we take the learnings from applied research and um, think about our future investments. For example, the, um, our whole teen community, the, the, the cross-community Jewish teen initiative came out of a research an applied research project that was done by Rosoff Consulting and Informing Change called Effective Practices in Teen Engagement. I mean, we learned so much from that and we designed a whole initiative around it. Um, the same is true with like the, the Jaffe research that we did, the um, Jewish Outdoor Food and Environmental Education. Um, that whole initiative was designed based upon the initial research that was done. Um, so I think that there are ways to 
answer questions and identify gaps and help the field use, think about research questions, gather data, and then use the information um, just to make us all better. Ariel, I'm wondering if you can share a little bit, um, you don't have to name names, about um, some projects that you've worked on that have involved foundation partners. Um, and what are the components of the relationship, the process, and the project that you thought helped make that successful? And then maybe what were some things that were more challenging? I want to give the participants here sort of a feel for what they might want to think about when they're thinking about investing in applied research and how the process might work. You know, so, all, you know, almost all of the work that we do um, at CASG um, is uh, specifically each, you know, research project is funded by, um, you know, uh, sponsored by foundation partners who um, uh, sort of share our interest in the question um, and think that it is going, has the potential to grow understanding and be useful to the field. Um, we've also had uh, like an alternative pathway to producing research uh, through our small grants program, which are for projects uh, of up to $30,000 that are actually driven by the field itself. They come from um, researchers and sometimes research practice partnerships, which we are uh, very bullish on at CASG, which are mutual long-term uh, relationships that are ongoing between researchers and practitioners. Um, and we've been interested in um, sponsoring sort of proto versions of those as well. So those are sort of two ways that CASG research happens. Um, I mean, I think that um, in general, we've found that um, our, uh, our, our, our sponsors and our foundation partners have been um, really excited to learn with us about the best way to make these large scale, very ambitious studies happen. And we've gotten a lot of encouragement to um, always seek sort of like the maximum benefit. And I'm just going to give an example. So uh, through our small grants open call, we received last year a very fine proposal um, uh, for a study about race in Jewish day schools that we've been incubating um, for over a year now. So we gave them some seed money to build out the proposal. We made some recommendations to them around um, thinking about looking sort of as a counterpoint race in um, other kinds of independent schools and also thinking about how Jews of color needed to be brought into the research team and really inform the design of the project. Um, and um, in seeking, now we're, you know, we're seeking funding, I hope I'm allowed to say that, um, in this context, um, for this larger study and uh, a piece of input that we've had and encouragement that we've had is to really formalize, like, how this is going to inform professional development and build that into the larger way that we're thinking about, um, about the project. And I think that that, to me, is really encouraging that we're kind of all on the same page about, um, you know, and I think Yehuda mentioned this as well, it really comes down to design, right? And um, uh, if we're not thinking about who's going to use it and how it's going to benefit them, then we, we end up at the end with, you know, populations talking across each other in terms, in, instead of uplifting uh, each other. And um, I think overall, there are a lot of people who are hearing that um, and enthusiastic about the promise of these new ways of producing research through these partnership relationships. And can I just add, like, it is very important to think about the user as you, as you begin and as you design, but also that end piece after, after the results are in and uh, maybe even before everything's all written up and everything's tied with a bow, putting it back out into the field and or pulling together people who are impacted by the research to really understand what is the, how is the field um, digesting this and how will they use it? I, like, I feel like that is an often overlooked piece um, as a funder and that really needs to be specifically written in as a step. Um, yeah. It's the final step or the next to final step before publication. Yeah. Um, and we've discussed this, like what are kind of like what there's not really any um, what I call like a knowledge exchange infrastructure 
in the Jewish communal and Jewish educational system. And we can look to the way that, um, you know, there are people who study knowledge uptake, knowledge use, um, cross communication between researchers and practitioners. And there are so many ways that we can do this by convening, um, you know, research policy working groups, for example, um, is something that I would love to be able to do at CASG to really think like, what are the pieces? How do we, how do we write up our findings so that they can best be heard and understood? Um, and that, that kind of work is really a two way street. Um, again, like of groups that are both equal and have equal power in the conversation. And there's not a lot of models for that right now uh, in Jewish education and Jewish communal research. And I would love to see uh, more opportunities for that uh, in the future. I just wanted to add, first of all, it, it's uh, incredibly humbling to be on the panel with Stacey and Ariel. I just feel really lifted up by everything that you're saying. And um, I'm learning a lot, just even as I'm thinking about what's the next thing that I'm going to say, I'm, I'm held back by the wisdom of some of the points that you're making. Um, I, my first encounter with evaluation was um, a few years into my work at the Bronfman Center. And we had, um, there, there was a funder who stepped forward who, who was, the vast majority of his funding went to key group organizations that were attempting to um, encourage people, especially young people, to become Orthodox. And, um, and they were particularly data-driven. They, even though we're a pluralistic institution, we're hopeful that through you know one program or another, uh, it would uh, encourage more young people to become Orthodox. And I remember one distinct conversation um, with the funder, where he said to me, "You know, you're, you're not really going to like what I'm going to say, but it basically costs a hundred thousand dollars to make somebody Orthodox." And I, I remember I remember hearing that and and, and cringing like. The idea that you could just like, because I'm on the ground, I'm working with students, teaching, and appreciative of their, you know, the different directions they might go. I'm like, what is that? You know, what does that mean? He's like, so this, you know, very simply, you know, if we work work with X number of students and it costs us X, you know, millions of dollars, do the math. That that's basically what it costs. And um, and to me, in that moment, uh, was really the moment that I felt okay. There's no chance this that this is gonna be a long-term relationship only because I, I understand the categories that he's working in, but they just do not match with the reality and the nature of people's experience as well as, you know, for, for a million and one reasons. And my guess is that the anecdote that I shared might evoke a particular emotional reaction in, or in some people. But, um, but I think it's a real challenge to have the, to, have, to build in a relationship between um, funders and people on the ground where the categories of assessment are of evaluation are constantly being informed by the work and 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 how how does a foundation you know while being committed to principle but enable sufficient listening on the part of the foundation to uh, adjust categories as as they may need to be adjusted so um, I, 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 most of my time is not spent in assessment per se Again, it's more in, in trying to develop, the, rooted in curiosity, trying to develop the categories, develop the paradigms. But, um, but, but I think the key thing for assessment is to always allow the categories to be informed by the, by the work that's being produced. Yeah, and Yehuda, I think you make a really, <clears throat> a really great point. And, and I've heard themes of this from Stacy and Ariel too, that one of the things about applied research is not losing the human story that is often lost in research or evaluation. Um, and that's really important because at the end of the day, if we're looking to solve real life problems, then we have to have real life people um, and their stories uh, evolved. So yeah, thank you for that. I have a couple of questions from um, some of our participants. Um, in, uh, in your opinion, which areas of Jewish education would best be served by applied research and should be prioritized in the near future? And I'll, I'll add on to this in the COVID era and in the long term. So let's not just sort of answer for COVID, but also in the long term for, for Jewish education. And whoever would like to begin is welcome. 
Well, I think I'm, I'm going to in some way, uh, like maybe dodge the question, although I have like my own ideas, certainly. And um, I'd love to talk with people about that. But I guess the part of the question, and I think it dovetails with the question just before is who sets the research agenda for the field? Um, and um, what are ways of ensuring that the that research agenda is not shaped by maybe like idiosyncratic interests but actually by what you know people doing the work um understand to be the most uh the the most enduring problems of practice the hardest nuts to crack and that actually reflect the lived realities and experiences of the contemporary american jewish community um, which is sometimes looks different than the Jewish professional class, right? Um, and what are ways, you know, a lot of what Yehuda said really resonated for me. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm an ethnographer by training, right? What, what I'm trained to do is actually listen to people. Um, this idea of being curious, right? And empathetic and listening for what people tell us they care about, they worry about, and they need. And I think that the way that the research agenda has been shaped thus far hasn't always taken into account where I think um, maybe the vast majority of American Jews are. And I'm going to give like, uh, maybe that's an overstatement, but I'm going to just give one example. And that is, um, we know that increasingly uh, uh, that there is some divergence in the American Jewish community. So younger Jews maybe are more likely to identify as Orthodox or Jews of no religion, right? Which is a, a, an example of like a category imposed on people and a need for a new paradigm, I'll say that. Um, but we haven't really been very curious or interested about like how do people who their primary lens on being Jewish isn't actually shaped by uh, religious commitments or identity, how they wanna be Jewish and what kinds of Jewish educational experiences and programs they're looking for and they might wanna enroll their children in. Um, because the people who are in the Jewish community are the ones who are more likely to see Judaism as a religious framework, perhaps, is one reason. Um, and so what does it take to kind of open things up a little bit to see where the community is, uh, what the needs are, and bring more diverse perspectives to the table to create a shared research agenda is a question I think about. Okay, any other thoughts and leaders, Stacey, about what should be prioritized in Jewish education? I mean, I think Ariel said it very well. Um, I think we try to not set every, I think we try to not only fund research that we, that only us is going to find interesting. Um, if, if other people, if it's, if it's not going to be useful to the practitioners or to other funders or, you know, then I, I think that we try to steer away from things like that. In my view, one of the things that's going to be need to be researched is number one, um, how much was lost. Uh, that is in terms of time, in terms of uh, uh, children's acquisition of Hebrew, whatever uh, other things within the context. You know, can we make up for lost ground? I mean, that's not just something that's true in Jewish education; it's in every educational framework. Can we make up for what was lost? Um, and that, uh, so that's curricularly, it's also in terms of socially, what skills wise has been lost that can be, can be regained and how. Um, and then thirdly, when it comes to kind of the effectiveness of, of Zoom school or particularly hybrid models, uh, one of my kid, my high schoolers have uh, three and a half days of in-person school and one and a half days of Zoom school. Uh, there's part of that which is working well, you know, they get to breathe for a day uh, being at home and without some of the social pressures. So I, I think that, that those would be areas of research, especially if they can be tied to better outcomes or financial models that are more, um, that, that, are, that are beneficial. So for me, those would be the three areas that I'm curious about. I have another question. So much is happening in social media and I'll add virtually. Have we seen any attempts to research how Jewish identity and practice are developing on these platforms? I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think back, uh, David Breifman's dissertation is actually about, um, in part, he was like one of the first people to use, I, I believe, Facebook as a, as a research tool. 
Um, so we actually have that. We have the tools to investigate that. We have the methodologies to understand that. I mean, the quest. I mean, there are. Um, I think proportionally, you know, compared to look, we don't know how much money we spend on Jewish educational programs nationally. That's that's not a known number, right? Um, uh, but we do probably have some sense of what's spent in research on these kinds of programs and how people learn about being Jewish in all kinds of places and in all kinds of settings, in formal programs, in their homes, online. Um, so I am certainly very interested in this question. Um, and I think that we could actually um, mobilize a lot of researchers and practitioners who would be interested in this question. Um, I think um, it's an issue of what are the resources that are available. This is like on, this is a question on my list. You know, what is learning about being Jewish online? What does that look like? Um, I mean, one of the most interesting things I, you know, I worked on that Gen Z Now study that Stacey um, referenced earlier and, you know, interviewing teens, particularly teens who um, were not um, growing up in formal Jewish educational programs. And if they got curious about what it was to be Jewish, they didn't ask their parents, right? They Googled it. Um, like we all know that's how it works. Um, and we have not, I don't think, been su sufficiently curious about um, how these kinds of platforms um, uh, and how people navigate their own curriculum and their own independent learning uh, making use of it. So I think it's a great question and uh, I'd be really curious to see uh, what we can learn about that. Yeah, I think one other thing to note, which has been very interesting is, um, you know, the Jewish sector has been talking for years about how younger generations of American Jews are less interested in things that are religious or ritually oriented. And in the age of COVID, we saw record numbers of people participating in high holiday services, a piece of research that, that Stacy and I worked on over the summer looked at Jewish virtual engagement and the number one Jewish activity, virtual activity people were participating in more than Shabbat dinners um, was attending virtual services. So I think this question of, you know, also now that maybe barriers are reduced, barriers that previously existed to walking into a synagogue um, or another institution and geographic barriers of being far away from people that you know or people that you might um, feel comfortable walking in the door with. I think this is an even more interesting question now. Not that I have an answer, but yeah. I think it's a really interesting question. Things but I do think a challenge is that the way the research infrastructure is designed, it's not really well designed for rapid response research. Um, we just don't have like a big, you know, we don't have a large number of people who do this work, who have kind of the flexibility in their, their work lives to pivot, who are supported, right? So that they can investigate problems that bubble up um, and so that we can actually generate resources. There's just not really like a research fund, right? That's just kind of available um, that people know how to access. Like you might have like regular grant cycles um, in education research. Um, we don't really have um, a, a program like that that uh, might allow uh, for these kinds of projects to emerge. So that is actually a great segue into the next question, which is who is doing applied research in the Jewish sector other than your two institutions? No, um, so I, I got a bit of a later start than Ariel. And as part of, you know, when we were starting up, I uh, asked myself exactly that question. Who is doing what we would call applied research? And, um, and what, what we found was very interesting, which is that there were, uh, I mean, besides Perikashi and, and one or two other places, um, that a lot of the work that was being done was either based in a university and like very theoretical, like uh, if the range is zero to 30,000, it was kind of like at the 25,000 level. Um, or it was being by um, consultancies, you know, on a, on a way where a foundation would pay for um, like market research or a very specific, uh, you know, where the terms or the frame of what was needed uh, were already set. And, uh, and that was kind of in a way, sorry, that was the opening that we saw in the space that we tried to enter in was, was um, where, where is the kind of um, slower moving, longer, 
longer reaching, um, humanities oriented uh, places, spaces where, which could give, which could um, bring practitioners up uh, off the ground a little bit and bring uh, theoreticians down from the sky a little bit. And that there were not many places where practitioners and scholars could, could come together. That was the unique spot that we found. Um, and, and what we also found is that in many, um, actually different geographic regions, there seemed to be one or two, two people whose work kind of dominated, um, whose social science research, research and paradigms have dominated um, uh, the, the area in the field. And part of what I was trying to do was to bring new voices in, elevate new voices, new categories, and, and um, through that, you know, to give a platform for more, for, for more people to play in this, in this space. Uh, so from my perspective, um, you know, CASG works um, with all kinds of people who are interested in doing applied research. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fairly small crowd though. And part, I think a big question is how do we get more people engaged in this work? So we work with um, uh, researchers in seminaries and universities. Um, we, we work with um, both for-profit for and nonprofit research entities. Um, and um, we're really curious about how we get more people engaged in some of these questions um, and problems. And um, I do think that, um, you know, it's interesting in terms of, you know, the university is producing a lot of scholars of, you know, of Jewish, uh, of, the, of Jewish tradition. Like we produce a lot of rabbis and PhDs in Jewish studies, but proportionally, we um, we prepare. I would say very few people who are prepared to do the kind of research that I would say is applied studies, whether that's driven by um, uh, you know sociology or economics or you know any one of those kinds of fields. We we just don't have a lot of programs and investment in producing people to do that work, and I think that. Um, the Jewish community needs, you know, rabbis and scholars to help us make meaning. But I think we also need um, social scientists to help us understand who we are and what we're doing um, and whether or not our programs are um, actually achieving the outcomes that we want to see. Um, so from my perspective, I would think that foundations would care a lot about that, that, you know, what's driving, you know, the philanthropy is to do a lot of good and that we want to know that our programs are doing good. Um, and to do that, we have to, we have to study them and understand. And are they designed to, I think, as Yehuda is reminding us, to actually even answer the right kinds of questions and see, see the world um, you know, as it is, as opposed to maybe some tired old frameworks that aren't maybe serving us well anymore. And I, you know, I appreciate so much the work they're doing to produce those new frameworks. Um, but we won't know if we're doing good Right, unless we unless we check, and we need people who can help us do to do that. Um, and there's right now a paucity of people. I would say um, we need more people. I echo that, and I think there's probably I think even more of a paucity in people in the pipeline. So it's just going to get worse. Can I just add one thing? Is that um, when we were, I was starting the Applied Research Collective and um, I started asking people if they would participate. I got very few no's. I mean, the, the only person who turned me down was Robert Putnam, uh, who, who said, I'm just, I would love to participate. I'm just too busy right now, but call me back later. Um, but really, anybody, it didn't matter like if they were already connected. And I, I just described what it was I was trying to do. They're like, sign me up. Even to the point where I'm like, no, but I, let me describe a little bit of what the commitments are. It was the, people, I think, I, I think there's a lot to be gained through a combination of, and you mentioned the pipeline, which is an interesting metaphor, because the pipeline implies, you know, people who are coming up through the system. Mm -hmm. But I think to get the best ideas, what we actually need is a combination of a strong pipeline and also people at different points in their career and coming from different, you know, places. Uh, coming together and, and, and ha having a dialogue. So I think that's ultimate. Most of the creativity is ultimately in translation. 
So somebody says, okay, you know, I've worked on whatever, and now, oh, similar but different challenge, apply this framework, and then all of a sudden you have it feels like a new idea. So that, that, that's what I'd say is that, is that we need a strong pipeline, but we also need to create a social space that is inviting both for insiders and for outsiders. The, the, if I were just to say this, the, I, I underestimated the degree of insecurity that people who did not, scholars who did not perceive themselves as insiders, whether it's because who they had married or how they had raised or how they had not raised their children or um, when the last time they were at services, the insecurity that they had about coming to a space to advise and the way I needed to reassure them that actually their voice was welcome. And I mean, I'll say that from Kazu's perspective, we've actually had a lot of success in getting like top scholars in their field to, to advise us. Um, like I, I always like to brag that sometimes I get to take meetings at like the National Academy of Science because that's some, who some of our advisors are. Um, and that's very exciting and it makes our work better. But I think there's actually a question of who has the capacity to, to just do the work um, that's challenging for us. When we initially imagined this panel, we were gonna have um, Amy Bach who runs Measures for Justice uh, on board and she works in using data to reform the criminal justice system. And, um, and I, you know, I look at her website and I, I see how many people she has doing data collection and doing data analysis. And I'm so jealous because <laughs> we could do so much and we could know so much um, if we just had, um, we just had more people and more resources to, to do that work. Um, and I think, uh, I think that's going to be an important question for us to think about in terms of the future of applied research because you know we can do one study here and one study there. Um, but what will it mean to like really be able to provide the field with the insight and data that it needs to make good decisions, um, we would have to really boost our efforts, I think, um, to really achieve that. Well, we have four minutes left. I'm going to uh, pose one more question, um, which is how, how do you think the Jewish federations could play a role in applied research. Many federations do their own research to inform their own community strategies, hiring external partners to support them on that research. So what might that look like through the lens of applied research? So, I mean, we work with, um, we work with federations uh, at the local level and we will work with JFNA um, also both, you know, with their Jewish education work with Beth Cousins and also um, in their you know, research that's led by uh, Lawrence Kotler Berkowitz. Um, and I think there are a lot of opportunities um, to, um, to continue that kind of um, like shared uh, data collection efforts. Um, you know, whether or not they all have the in-house capacity, some of them are building in-house capacity um, to do research. Um, some of it is very demographic oriented um, just to get a picture of the community um, and maybe a next step would be about thinking about what applied research in terms of supporting and understanding um, the programs that they're funding um, and what that means um, for their community members uh, would be an exciting direction. Any last thoughts? Yeah, no, I mean, I was just going to say, I think there could be power in doing some regional um, projects to think about several um, Federations coming together to do something together. I was sad that that uh, um, I think there's a lot within federations uh, that is probably understudied from a historical standpoint. Might be interesting. So not not in not, not looking for market research or or demographic understanding, but but even just looking back, you know, ten years. How how have we been? How's our funding changed? Why has it changed? Um, has that been intentional? Have we been slipping? Um, where are we headed? You know, so I think from a historical standpoint, it could be interesting whether federations study themselves or they invite, they open themselves to being studied by others, which I know many people in we don't want to do, but um, I think that, that could be an interesting thing. You know, sometimes holding the, the mirror of history up to an organization or philanthropy or foundation um, produces un, can produce unforeseen results. During the coronavirus crisis, the federations that have endowments or large endowments um, 
when they meet uh, the statement that was put out by the whatever the Federation in New York was called a hundred years ago uh, during the depression and how whoever was the head of the Federation said, you know, we'll spend down every dollar of the endowment just to make sure that people have the services that they need. I don't think that's the way anybody's thinking now. You know, I don't think that there are many organizations who are saying we should spend down our endowment, whatever we need in order to provide for the people who are being most affected that if there was, if we were saving for a rainy day, this is the rainy day. Mm -hmm. I don't know many people who are thinking that way. I don't know if they should, but I know that the mirror of history prompts that question. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Thank you, Stacy, Ariel, and Yehuda for a great conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, and I want to echo that thank you on behalf of Jeff and thank you to all of our panelists and our moderators and everybody that participated. I do see that we have questions we couldn't even get to, which is always good and bad. It's good because it means that we need to continue this conversation and that there was interest. And I hope that we'll be able to do that in future programs to continue diving deeper and building our philanthropic toolbox here together at GFN. Um, and it's bad, of course, because we always wish that we can get to everybody, but, um, but we, you know, being respectful of time, we just can't. So thank you all again for joining and thank you all for, your, for sharing your wisdom with us today. And I look forward to, to partnering again in the future. Have a good day, everybody. Stay well. Thank you.